Hello, welcome to another session of the 69th Annual State History Conference. Uh, my name is Jedediah Rogers with the Utah State Historical Society. And I just wanna remind anyone listening and tuning in that the full schedule of our conference programming as well as recorded versions of all panels and sessions uh, at this conference and in conferences of recent years past are all available um, through a link on our website to our YouTube channel. You can access our website at either history.utah.gov or ushs.utah.gov. And so, um, so there's lots of content there. In addition to what we'll be um, providing for this session, I am going to turn it over to Val Hawley um, here, he, who is chair, who will also provide comment at the end of the two presentations. Val is an independent historian uh, living in New York City. His 25th Street Confidential, Drama, Decadence, and Dissipation along Ogden's Rowdiest Road won the Utah Book Award in nonfiction. And I'm happy to say the book that I'm holding up here is Biography of Frank Cannon has won the Best Book Award uh, for the Utah State Historical Society this year. Um, and he, he's being awarded this year for this effort. So congratulations, Val. Um, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Jed. Uh, I'm pleased to chair this session on soldiers and venereal disease. <clears throat> We're, we'll hear today from Sarah Langston and Heidi Chudy. Sarah will go first and let me introduce her. She is the head of special collections and assistant professor at Weber State, where she has worked since 1999. Sarah has an MA in Russian history from Utah State and an MLS with a focus on archives from San Jose State University. She's the co-author of four books on the history of Ogden. Sarah's research interests include the history of Ogden, 25th Street, women, crime, and oral history. Sarah is also the host of an upcoming podcast series called Tales from Weber that focuses on stories from Ogden's history. Sarah will be glad to hear from you now. Thank you, Val. Uh, so my paper is entitled, A Wide Open Town, Ogden and Public Health. Ogden has long been described as untamed and a wide open town where people could indulge in any vice within walking distance from the train station. It was said that 25th Street was no, well known across the country that one could address a letter to 25th Street with no city or state and it would arrive in Ogden. Along with the wide openness of the town came health issues that the city and state government struggled to deal with. The rise in venereal disease during the 1940s and 1950s became so prevalent that the federal government had to get involved in order to protect, to protect the health and wellness of the servicemen traveling through Ogden or stationed at one of the military installations in the area. Prior to the outbreak of World War II, the federal government had a minimal presence in Northern Utah with the Ogden Arsenal that was built after World War I to house ammunition and weapons from the war. With the growing threat of war in Europe, the government chose Northern Utah to be the site for three new military bases, Hillfield, Clearfield Naval Supply, and the Defense Depot Ogden. These brought thousands of servicemen and civilian workers into the area. The men would often head into Ogden for recreation that could include a cold beer, a poker game, or even the company of a lady. Ogden, since the coming of the railroad, had attracted commercialized prostitution. Belle London first appeared in the city in 1888 and grew her business to become the most profitable madam in town. It was said that she ran the city and had government officials and police in her back pocket. Belle was so well known that in 1909, Salt Lake City approached her to run their stockades in the north end of the city. She was only there for a couple of years before the political climate changed and she was forced to move back to Ogden. She left Ogden in, in, she left Utah in 1920, but other madams and prostitutes took her place. On the north side of 25th Street behind the buildings was Electric Alley. 
This area was filled with one room crib, cribs where the prostitutes would ply their trade. The cribs would often have just a bed and bathroom fixtures. During the height of the prostitution trade in Ogden, there were hundreds of women engaged in the occupation and could be found not only in Electric Alley, but also brothels, bars, taverns, and even walking the streets. The prevalence of prostitution led Ogden to recognize the need to treat the increase in venereal diseases as early as 1920. During a health board proceeding for the city, Dr. Nelson reported that, quote, venereal diseases were being treated at the office of Dr. Wallen in the Eccles building instead of the clinic room at City Hall and recommended that this be continued as it was more satisfactory to handle. Up until the 1940s, the city health department would deal with venereal diseases through private practice and not run cases through the clinic. By the 1930s, the federal government in the form of the American Social Hygiene Association began investigating the rise of venereal disease in Utah and sent field investigators to look into the issues to try and find solutions. In 1931, Newell Edson went to Ogden and wrote back, quote, there is no venereal disease clinic in the state and no funds for venereal disease work in the state. The reportings on doctors is poor. Dr. Beatty feels it is impossible to get the legislature to recognize the importance of venereal diseases and to make appropriations for it. The prostitution situation is very bad, not only in Salt Lake City, but in other places. Working with Edson and the American Social Hygiene Association, Utah looked into creating its own venereal disease clinic, as well as encouraging cities to create, establish their own. During the 1931 visit, Edson also met with Mr. Milton Welling, who was Secretary of State, that, but had also served as part of the legislature during the passage of the Chamberlain Con Bill, and talked about getting a treatment center in Utah. The Chamberlain Con Bill was passed in 1918 to combat the spread of venereal disease during World War I. It gave the power to the government to quarantine any woman suspected of having a sexually transmitted disease. A medical exam was necessary, and it, if a STD was revealed, it would constitute proof of prostitution. This woman could then be sentenced to the hospital until she was cured. The act made funds available to states that had laws that pertain to the control of venereal diseases. Utah had enacted such a law in 1911 that required the reporting of syphilis and gonorrhea, but lacked any funding for enforcement. The Chamberlain Con Act allowed these funds to be used for the reporting and education of disease prevention and treatment in Utah. Newell Edson visited Ogden in 1933 and cited the rottenness of the situation in the city. He said it was, quote, the worst in the state where the city commissioner and mayor have recently been indicted by the grand jury for connection with commercialized vice. It turned out that Mayor Ora Bundy, Sheriff Amasa Hammond, Chief of Police A.E. Wilfong, Police Officers M.L. Christensen and w. L. W. Pack, Commissioner Fred E. Williams, along with Deputy Sheriffs Jack Habertson and Erastus Bingham, were all arrested and charged with violating the Federal Prohibition Act. They were all found not guilty as there was no evidence to support the conspiracy charge or, to, or the ability to prove any direct payments to the defendants. Nevertheless, this showed just one example of how the federal government worried about the close ties between Ogden city officers and the vice that ran rapid in the streets. By 1939, Ogden, Utah, Ogden city recognized the need to control and prevent the spread of venereal diseases. They founded a city health department to open a venereal disease clinic in downtown Ogden. The clinic officially opened in November 1939 in the basement of the city county building. According to the Ogden Standard Examiner on August 25th, 1940, the numbers of those seeking advice, examination or treatment has shown a gradual increase to the point where employees feel that they are accomplishing at least some good in the field that has too long been shrouded in public taboo. The city averaged about, the clinic averaged about 48 patients weekly with mostly young women under the age of 25, but saw patients as young as 15 and as old as 70. The supplies for the clinic were given by the state and federal government, included treatment chairs, treatment tables, chairs, sterilizers, and glassware. 
The clinic was originally open Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 12.30 to 2.30 p.m. They quickly realized the need for evening hours for those patients who worked, so they opened for one night a week. The first clinic nurse hired was Alta Ross Kelly in March of 1940. She was a graduate from the D School of Nursing and had gone on to study public health nursing. According to Ross Kelly, quote, it was interesting to talk to with these young women. The minute they had thought they were positive with gonorrhea or another VD, they left town. They would just disappear. They were required to come to the clinic every week and have an examination. Ross Kelly also remembered that many of the prostitutes would ask her not to recognize them on the street, on the street, especially if she was in uniform. She recalled a madam being arrested because she had a positive test. The police ended up putting her in jail where Alta had to interview her about her exposures. Alta remembered quite vividly one experience with Dr. Barnes, who was substituting for Dr. Knoll, the head of the clinic. Dr. Barnes said, quote, these women have the cleanest interiors I have ever seen. It looks to me like they have used a rotary brush. I suppose they would be exceptionally careful when they came in and tried to clean up as much as they could so they did not have a positive test. The police department gave orders to all prostitutes in Ogden that they had to have a weekly checkup on Thursdays at 7 p.m. They would line up outside the clinic office and wait for their exam. The police hoped that the weekly exam would catch infections early and keep the rate of infections low. The problem was, as Dr. Glenn Gardner stated in 1941, quote, a prostitute may, by smear examination, be, de be determined to be free of venereal diseases today, but tomorrow may be infected and infect anyone with whom they have sexual contact with after that. That's not only true here, but that's true everywhere. By the start of World War II, the federal government became concerned with the rise of venereal disease and openness of prostitution in Ogden. In July 1943, Raymond Greeman of ASHA visited Ogden in order to establish the Weber Health Association and to discuss a VD control program with officials. He met with numerous people in the city over the period of, week, of the week and made the following conclusion. Quote, Ogden is a wide open town Many exposures are reported by army authorities on 25th Street. Pickup points are the cheap bars and taverns. The places of exposure are rooming houses, hotels, automobiles, city parks, and alleys. Most of the dives are located within a two blocks from the Union Pacific train station, attracting passengers between their trains. It appears to be a great deal of indifference toward the problem of promiscuity. The army is making special effort to meet the high infection rate among Negro soldiers by putting Tuskegee trained soldiers in the prophylactic station. There is a need for immediate arousing of citizens to this dangerous situation, which army officers indicate is similar to that which might be caused by allowing an exploded bomb to rest in the middle of a, a principal city street. The Hilltops Times reported on a lecture at Hillfield in 1943 presented by Howard Feast the regional representative for the Federal Security Administration. He stated that, quote, 50% of the cases of venereal disease at Hillfield and Ogden came from, from Hillfield in August, excuse me, came from prostitutes operating in the city of Ogden. Prostitution, prostitution still exists in Ogden, especially among colored women, and this problem must be controlled by civilian police rather than the military. If soldiers know where to find those, these women, the police must certainly be able to find them as well. He recommended that the city add a specialty trained vice squad along with the addition of police women to handle the girls in taverns, rooming houses, and dance halls. The Ogden City Commission agreed to propose an ordinance which would forbid unescorted women from frequenting taverns and other places that may become pickup centers. The situation distressed the military as the women were picked up by the soldiers and taken to their rooms. They wanted hotels and rooming houses to do vice policing on their own account. They would also instruct city police and the health department to cooperate more fully with the Federal Rapid Tra Treatment Center in Salt Lake City. With the rise of venereal disease nationwide, the government sought out medical situations. Rapid treatment centers first appeared during World War II. 
The federal government became concerned with the increase of venereal disease transmission among soldiers in the United States. Prior to the centers, the military and civilian leaders would deal with disease in, quote, women without morals by fining them $10 and putting them in jail for 10 days, but did not do anything to curb the spread of infection. The first center was established in 1939 at Leesville in Louisiana, where the head of the State Board of Health received $75,000 from the Federal Security Administration to turn deserted barracks into a 120-bed hospital. The process was, quote, when army doctors discover a soldier has a venereal disease, he is questioned at length. Lists of his contacts are made and the girls are rounded up for a check. If blood tests show they have syphilis or if there's any evidence of gonorrhea, they are taken to the hospital immediately. Under the provisions of the Lanham Act passed in 1938, funds were made available to state and local governments for the construction and operation of the RTCs. These centers were for quarantining and treating venereal infected women in areas near military camps and defense industries. Raymond Bondelier, Chief of the Public Health Service Venereal Disease Division, wrote a letter in October 1942 that these facilities were, quote, detention centers to provide treatment for prostitutes infected with venereal disease. Men were often seen as the victims of the disease and women were its source. During World War II, the PHS produced many posters, leaflets, and films aimed at men in the armed forces to warn them against having sex with prostitutes or women of easy virtue. For example, one poster depicted a rather worn prostitute as a Duke joint sniper with syphilis and gonorrhea. She was a threat to the war effort by infecting men with disease. By 1943, the US Public Health Service had already planned to expand the rapid treatment centers and had over 20 facilities in operation. The centers required anywhere from a few days to several weeks with the drugs being administered by an intravenous strip or multiple injections. The women were often confined to bed during the treatment. One PHS official wrote that the treatment was needed. One PHS official wrote that the treatment regime and the need for the rapid treatment centers to have greater control of the over the administration of, the, of medicine was, quote, we all began to realize we needed a greater element of control over these girls. We needed to remove them from the community and control them so that they could not continue their pro promis promiscuous activity. We needed to control them so that we could be absolutely sure that they received every bit of treatment that they so badly needed. The center in Salt Lake City was one of the earliest to open in the country. By no October 1943, the center was established at 115 South State Street and was for the purpose of detention of prostitutes and promiscuous women who had been found to have venereal diseases. The women would stay for 10 weeks for syphilis and three weeks for gonorrhea. Dr. Bigelow, the head of the State Board of Health, chided Weber County saying that, quote, according to our records, Weber County has a higher rate of venereal disease and therefore we do not feel like they are using the facility as much as they should be. The treatment was free to anyone infected. The center was able to use police and quarantine power to require any unwilling patient to submit to treatment. If the patient, if the patient didn't arrive on his or her own, police would pick them up and drive the patient to the center. The treatment was a combination of an arsenical penicillin and bismuth injected into the patient for syphilis and for gonorrhea, it was penicillin alone. The center had a capacity of 40 patients and received patients from all parts of the state. Dr. Bigelow was quick to note that, quote, during treatment, patients are given an opportunity to earn money by doing odd jobs at the center so that upon release, they have su sufficient money to ensure themselves a few meals and nights lodging. These patients are given an opportunity also to accept legitimate positions in defense work upon release. Dr. Bigelow, of course, is referring to the prostitutes that made up of the majority of the patients. On a side note, in an article that ran in the Salt Lake Tribune on August 15, 1945, about the use of penicillin, included a haunting photograph of a woman being treated with her face completely erased. 
leaving her less than human. By July 1943, the military grew more concerned about the situation in Ogden. The American Social Hygiene Association, along with army officers, met with concerned Ogden citizens, including club women, ministers, doctors, lawyers, and health committee workers, to discuss the problem of local commercialized prostitution and the rise in venereal rates. According to a newspaper story that ran on July 12th, one of the statements from the group was, quote, the venereal rate at Hillfield is higher than the rate as a whole in the Air Corps. Another warned that if nothing was done to reduce the rate of disease, that the Army, Navy, and United States Public Health Service would take control of the situation. Colonel L.D. Fader, the commanding officer at Hillfield, issued an ultimatum to the city to cooperate with the military authorities in battling Ogden's growing venereal disease problem or face the imposition of military regulations. According to Fader, quote, we are not getting the desired cooperation from the city administration. After the election, the venereal disease condition became worse in Ogden after a small improvement had been experienced. Mayor Harmon Perry was elected in 1943 and said he didn't have to meet with military officers because most of the vice was carried out in the main hotels of the city and he couldn't control it. The military gave the administration just five weeks to clean up the city. The health department and police agreed to work with the military. There was police cooperation for a short time, but it relaxed because the officer says that the courts would not con convict women arrested for prostitution. The city, however, did approve the Army Medical Corps to construct a prophylactic and first aid station near the Union Station. The building personnel and equipment would be furnished by the Army and under the direction of Hillfield. The need for that station was due to the conditions on 25th Street, where there were unlimited possibilities for inquiring, acquiring a venereal infection as on the part of the troops passing through or stationed in the area. As Dr. Glenn Garner remarked in an oral history interview in 1972, it did pose a problem because many of the soldiers who were in transit and had some layover time in Ogden and also came in from very, various places like Hillfield Air Force Base, the Arsenal and Supply Depot, contracted venereal disease and it became rather widespread. This made it necessary to instigate some control program that would be effective. Of course, the process is try, to try and eliminate the practice of prostitution, which is a difficult problem. Usually it results in moving the prostitution, prostitutes from lo one location to another. You can drive them out of the cheap hotels and rooming houses on 25th Street, close them down, but they simply move out of the resident out into the residential sections, renting a house and setting up all over again. The federal government pushed Ogden City officials to crack down on prostitutes and women of loose morals that frequented taverns and bars. On July 11th, 1941, Congress passed the May Act to help combat the prostitution problem nationally. The purpose of the statute was to curb the loss of manpower to armed forces and civilian personnel caused by venereal disease. The act stated that, quote, until May 15, 1945, it shall be unlawful within such reasonable distance of any military or naval camp, station, fort, yard, base to engage in prostitution or to aid or abet prostitution or to procure or solicit for the purpose of prostitution. The military preferred that local law enforcement eliminated prostitution in their own communities so that it did not have to invoke the act. Ogden faced a problem with the conviction of prostitutes in the city. Ogden City Judge J. Quill Nebaker refused to try prostitution cases unless soldiers were permitted to take the witness stand, which was contrary to military policy. The military pushed for the imposition of the maximum vagrancy set sentence of six months in jail on prostitutes, which they felt would help clear up the situation. Nebaker responded, quote, unless the prosecution proves, it ca proves its case, it is just as much my duty to protect the defendant. As far as indicating what penalty I will impose, I will not say because every case that comes before me must be considered on its own merits. 
1944, the American Social Hygiene Association remarked that commercial prostitution was a, pro a profitable enterprise and often closely linked with local politics and policies or politicians. Prostitution in one form or another is the greatest spreader of venereal disease. Because of the legal activity, one ASHA member told community leaders, it, the quickest way of reducing the number of cases of gonorrhea in any community is to curb its prostitution. Both the house or streetwalker professional and the semi-pro of the taverns. One of the biggest roadblocks in ridding Ogden of commercialized vice was Mayor Harmon Peary. He fought for the continuance of the red light district because taxing the brothel owners brought money into the city's coffers. In 1944, he was voted out of office, but seemed to find himself back the very next year. In, in June 1945, ASHA field officer John Hall reported on his meeting with Mayor Perry. Quote, he has an uncouth, sloppy appearance, and this goes for the litter on his desk and the manner of his speech. I explained that this was a courtesy call. He is the chairman of the Army Advisory Committee here, so I emphasized our work with the military in the new defense program. He seemed half aware of what was going on, and the interview was definitely a minus quality. Hall went on to talk to Ezra Feldstead, who was the head of Chamber of Commerce. Feldstead marked, remarked that Perry was an out and out rascal and that the leaders had tried to get him out of office, but he came back every few years. The police department was also short on personnel and fell far below the standard. The sheriff's actions were being curtailed because of the mayor. As an example of the corruption of Perry, he had the, quote, Perry program. It was the, quote, privilege of operating gaming, gambling games handed to the Sharpers. For this privilege, the gamblers submitted to arrest on regular intervals, put up sums of bail to be for for forfeited into the city's coffers, whereupon they would go back to their games to fleece the suckers undisturbed until they were tapped on the shoulder again to pay their protection money once more. Knowing that the city government would be little help, the ASHA and health officials tried to combat the rise of prostitution and therefore infections in military personnel by conducting undercover studies. George Gould in May of 1944 recommended that a study be made of prostitution and related conditions in Ogden. He wanted a particular emphasis on the Royal Hotel, 24th Street, 25th Street, and Wall Avenue. The reports would then be given to military officials and city officials to use the information as they could to help prevent the spread of the diseases. Often, the venereal disease clinic offer, officers at Hillfield would use the report to add places where prostitutes frequented onto the off-limits list for military personnel. Over the next year, the venereal rates at Hillfield continued to rise. According to a field report of John Holland, June of 1945, quote, military venereal disease rate has increased from 40 in 1943 to approximately 65 now. Negro, pro Negro prostitution in Ogden causes about half of the locally acquired cases. As I have reported elsewhere, the situation is considered the worst in the state. Local officials vary in their attitudes. The police in Ogden faced a shortage of officers and the vice squad and female police officers were no longer active by 1945. There was the case of one prostitute that had been and had infected at least six had infected at least six soldiers and had been through treatment several times but was still operating in Electric Alley. There was no court action against her to get her out of the game. The army rate continued to gain momentum in spite of the fact that modern science had a specific cure for venereal diseases that was free, rapid, and confidential. During 1944 through 1947, the political climate in Ogden changed with the election of new mayors. Harmon Perry was out and Kent Bramwell and David Romney were in. They worked to try and clean up commercialized prostitution in Ogden. In October of 1945, the Ogden Standard Examiner touted that, quote, with the actual number of pickups and contacts made in Ogden taverns and hotels and by prostitutes and promiscuous women drastically reduced during the past 18 months. 
Local social protection committees were urged to hold these gains in the conversion period immediately ahead. The repression programs of the health and enforcement community, committees, along with the education efforts, had a marked effect on the reduction of venereal disease rates in Ogden. The problem then shifted from professionals to, quote, victory girls. These were young women who would pick up returning soldiers at bars and taverns. They often lacked the education of pros professional prostitutes to help prevent the spread of the diseases. According to William Anderson in his article, How to Keep Rosie the Riveter from Contracting VD, quote, the ASHA campaign underlined the perceived peril of what women outside the home could do to the preferred by some social structure. The assumption that the transmission of VD occurred when a woman seduced a man created the perception that she was more culpable for the contraction of the disease than him. With organized prostitution being driven out of the city, the problem of disease transmission was confined to the pick of girls at the bar of the street. Quote, 80% of these girls that, in, that are infected are below the age of 24, with the biggest group in the ages of 15 to 18. The city attempted to curb these incidents by not allowing city single women into bars or taverns in the hopes that they would not solicit the military men as they were bar hopping on 25th Street. The police and mayor were committed to enforcing the vice laws in all segments of Ogden society. A black health department officer was assigned to Ogden to bring in girls for examination and treatment that had never before been located. This helped to decrease the rise in positive rates in Black military personnel that had been stationed at Hill. The Black officer was Marshall Doc White. Doc had received his military degree specializing in podiatry, but joined the Army during the war. He was stationed in hospitals and was eventually sent to Hillfield and Ogden to help the VD clinic to try to decrease the rates of disease infecting the military men. He was able to work closely with Ogden Police Department as a special officer assigned to the Black sections of town to bring in the Black prostitutes. Marshall had to interview prostitutes and their clientele, drug dealers and addicts, transients, civilian and military personnel. Forming close relationships, he documented their illness and communicated this information to the proper authorities, state and federal hospitals, as well as military or law enforcement agencies. The crackdown on vice was working until 1948 when Harmon Perry was once again elected mayor of Ogden. The ASHA representative was dismayed that, mayor, that Perry had been reelected. On November 10th, 1948, he spoke to Mr. Greenwell at the Ogden Standard Examiner and was given details on the backslide in Ogden. Mayor Perry is the wealthiest, largest landowner in the city. Although he was indicted a few years ago for his collaboration with houses of prostitution, nevertheless, he is now back in office. His appeal lies in low taxes and the picturesque tradition of a rough and ready open town. The sheriff was recently caught up in one of the houses itself, although there is a slight question of a frame up. Greenwell doubts the latter. A revision of the city constitution may bring about more regular meetings of the city grand jury. Until now, it has not been too effective. The chief of police, Maurice Scoff, is new. To date, Scoff has not endeavored to buck the mayor. Greenwell has been working on him to try and prick his ambition as a police officer to show the name he could make for himself if he would just gather the courage. Scoff said he would take whatever steps he could to stamp out commercialized vice. He wanted to close Ogden's houses of prostitution and said it was a must. Mayor Perry fought back saying, it would be impossible to stamp out prostitution unless every hotel in Ogden was closed. With Perry up for re-election in 1949, ASHA decided to try and work to get him defeated. With the newly reorganized Army Advisory Committee with Frank Browning now replacing Peary as chairman. This committee served as a link between the public and the military. It was to be a place for the exchange of ideas and knowledge so that each side knew more about the other. P 
Browning had served as a colonel in World War II and understood the military complex. He was keenly aware of the problems surrounding the soldiers and the lack of proper entertainment in Ogden. The LDS Church had also been rallying its female members to fight juvenile delinquency and could easily be organized to fight for the suppression of prostitution. The ASHA rec recommended that a confidential study of Ogden happen before the next election and to use these results to help influence the powers that be. The Utah Social Hygiene Association began to put pressure on the mayoral candidates to be against prostitution or lose backing. Even the governor was putting pressure on Ogden as well. The Air Force Doctrine Center decided to list resorts in Ogden as off limits to military personnel. According to Charles Taft, the head of the Federal Division of Social Protection, quote, too many were contracting venereal diseases in Ogden resorts. The commanding officers could, should clamp down an off limits order on the community. Perry said that the city government and police would not cooperate with the order and refused to clean up the city. As a result of pressure from outside parties, Perry was defeated as mayor and Rulon White was elected. White and city officials wasted no time trying to remove prostitution from Ogden. However, problems remained with the Ogden police force and sheriff at each other's throats and accusing each other of corruption. As Patrick Kelly wrote in one of his reports, on a return trip to Ogden, Pennock and I visited Sheriff Mac Wade and his deputies far and car. They put on quite a show for us as a young girl and cab driver were brought in at the time as the result of charges by the fam girl's family of drink and sex the previous night. Obviously the sheriff liked the idea of showing that his office is on the job. This may have been the window dressing but I believe the cab company involved is going to get it. The city attorney, Maurice Richards, tried to clean up the city with convictions for prostitution and going after the big madams in the city like Rose Davey. In October, 1949, the first district court issued a writ of injunction against the Rose Rooms for operating houses of prostitution. Rose and her husband, William, were convicted of operating houses of prostitution and sentenced to prison for three years. With the city being cleaned up, the AFDC even removed the off-limit restrictions from the National Cap Tavern, Bluebird Tavern, Hub Tavern, and El Baracho due to the improved conditions. The city continued to work on eradicating vice from Ogden's streets. By 1952, the military lauded Ogden's success in driving out commercialized vice. Quote, Ogden has a lower syphilis rate than the city for the first time in many years seven per 100,000 population as compared to 8.1 in Utah. There continued to be numerous clinic and field visits by the health department in the 1950s, but the cases of the venereal diseases seen at the clinic continued to drop. By 1953, the health department cited that the cases of venereal disease dropped from an average of 121 per year to just 56 per year. The Ogden Standard reported that there was, quote, no house of prostitution operating within the city, within the city or its immediate vicinity, although a few pickups were observed in some taverns frequented by white customers. The final field report of the ASHA in 1951 found that Ogden was holding up their own against prostitutes and the rates of venereal disease were down 75% in the past year over the previous three years when the house, before the houses were closed. John Hall still recommended that the department make up a study of Ogden about every six months until they have cleaned up for good. He was still concerned about black prostitution going on and that there was something peculiar going on down at the Kokomo Club on 25th Street. By 1960, the city had been declared a clean city by ASHA, even People who used to know 25th Street can remember when the street had houses of prostitution strung like beads. Now the people connected with organized vice have left, left town. And an individual seeking a prostitute has to look a long time. Ogden vice has apparently been brought to an irreducible minimum. There will still be some vice in any community, but an effective city government and police force can keep it at a minimum. 
Ogden has often been described as a wide open town that offered all vices known to man. It was not until the federal government and military got involved in the city during World War II that the city decided to start cleaning up. Prostitution in the downtown area caused for a, ra a rise in venereal diseases among servicemen and civil wor civilian workers to the point where it was hampering the war effort. The American Social Hygiene Association was sent out to observe the happenings in town and to try and convince the public to help curtail prostitution. It was an often an uphill battle as professional prostitutes were traded for local girls who picked up soldiers, as well as the lack of involvement from the police and city officials. The military would often put bars and taverns on the off limits list for servicemen to try and help stop the spread of disease. It took almost 15 years and a change in government officials to finally be able to suppress prostitution and curb the rate of venereal disease infection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that presentation. We're now going to hear from Heidi Chudy, who is at the Division of State History, the Utah Division of State History, and works in the National History Day program. Heidi, you're on. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can share screen. Okay. <laughs> My presentation is Venus on the Field of Mars, a combustible mix. I've always liked the illusion of, um, well, just love coming out of the fear of, field of the battlefield. In the 1930s of America, the threat of another world war loomed. The United States government began to gear up with the fight. The Great War demonstrated that much of the war would be fought in the sky. The Army Air Corps needed to expand operations. Existing air bases would, needed, would need to grow and new ones created. For towns still reeling from the economic blows of the Great Depression, this boost of employment and commerce was a welcome boon. However, many, young, many communities found themselves in uncharted territory regarding how an influx of young men in uniform can negatively affect their towns. The U.S. Army knew exactly what the mix of young soldiers and eager to please locals could yield. The troops of World War I lost more man days to treatment of venereal disease than to any combat injury. While it can be argued that the U.S. Army was not in the fight long, proportionally, the numbers were still foreboding for what would occur during another major buildup. Venus gaining, gaining territory on the field of Mars is nothing new. Large scale military events always result in increased numbers of camp followers, hasty marriages and increased births. Along with this is the rise in law, along with the rise of these numbers is escalating disease rates. Camp follower is a tricky word. Technically, it refers to prostitutes who cater to military units, but World War II saw an expansion of this term. Khaki wacky and prostitutes, uh, khaki wackies and patriotutes were new ways to define the women who, while not technically prostitutes, could not say no to a soldier. This made controlling the disease rates even more difficult. In 1939, the U.S. government funded the expansion of Chinute Army Airfield in Rantoul, Illinois. And it is this really itty bitty little town over here somewhere. <laughs> um, and the creation of Hill Army Airfield in Layton, Utah. One had great success at controlling the disease rate of their soldiers. One did not. Both found that reliance on collaboration between the military and civilians were key. If you were to look at the topography and population maps, the areas around Chanute and Hill would seem disparate. Historically, they were also different. Chanute was created during the end of World War I. 
as a training place for new pilots. The war ended and the base quickly became a place of exile for unlucky men sent there. The popular phrase was, don't shoot them, shoot it. Ranchel was still a town of 2000 when preparations for World War II began, but it was a mere 15 miles from the nearest college town and 40 miles from a town known for its notorious red light district. Those 40 miles were not insurmountable for soldiers on leave. Bus lines and rail lines were available. If not, there were always the kind folk of Illinois willing to give a lift to a man in uniform. The line, as it was called, of Bloomington, Illinois was as accessible to the soldiers of Rantoul as Ogden's 25th Street was to soldiers passing through the Union Station. The US government broke ground for Hill Army Airfield in 1939. The area surrounding the base had little experience with military civilian interaction. Fort Douglas was in Salt Lake City, after all, 40 miles from Ogden. To the military and the folks of Ogden, the big city was far away. But a lonely soldier on leave finds a way to occupy his time and, quote, if he's gonna fight, he's got a right to romance. Both areas combated rising disease rates. Both had varying success rates. The 1940-1941 disease rates for the Selective Service inductees gave little indication of how rates would rise and fall in the coming years. The volunteers of Utah registered relatively little disease rates. One could look at the rates of Illinois and nod their head. Well, yes, the big city folk had higher rates. However, it is not the disease rates of the new recruits that was to be feared, but rather the combination of soldiers, local gals, and those willing to provide, provide quote, $2, two minutes for $2. Soldiers traveling through Ogden got off the train at 25th Street known as Two-Bit Street. Between 1870 and the 1950s, it was known as a place a man could find some companionship. Whether stopping on the way to a new duty station or on leave from a local base, a man knew he could find a good time there. Though the police had been successful in ridding the street of obvious solicitation, such as scantily clad women and windows, Prostitution was still a thriving industry. Union Station was home to a bustling canteen and USO activities, but the siren song of 25th Street was strong. Soldiers at Chinook did not have to leave, did not have to leave town to find the wholesome activities. Upon learning the base would expand, the USO quickly built a new facility and added another one in 1942. But, quote, tiddlywinks is no substitute for a girl. Many sought recreation in the towns nearby. Champaign-Urbana was a mere 15 miles away. The University of Illinois held weekly dances for co-eds and soldiers. While Ogden fought the existence of taxi dance halls, the towns around Chanute found them as accept an acceptable alternative to other evils. Paying a girl a dime a dance was viewed as controllable interaction between the local girls and the, and the soldiers. Shutting down red light districts was imperative. Both bases had specifically appointed venereal disease officers. Chanute had the good fortune of continuity with one appointee throughout the war. The Provost Marshal, Captain Green, was able to enforce the May Act in local areas and even get co cooperation from outlying areas. Bloomington, Illinois, 40 miles from Chanute, increased police presence to the, in the effort to close down the line, their notorious red light district. Ogden struggled with this issue. At least three Hill VD officers faced the challenge. While 1943 saw an incredible drop in disease rates in central Illinois, 
with 66% of prostitutes in brothels apprehended. It was the year officials at Hill Army Airfield became incensed over Ogden's lack of vice control. Referring to it as an epidemic, officials threatened to place Ogden off limits to all soldiers on leave. Well, <clears throat> while there were many problems stemming from military and local community relations, one issue they both didn't address was the changing moral climate of World War II. Sexual amours became a little topsy-turvy for small town America, from men and women relationships to same sex ones. Women were bombarded with, you can't say, oh my, sorry. With messages to lift the servicemen's spirits in chaste ways, but to remember, you can't say no to a soldier. Both areas needed to accept that during the time, that during wartime, ideals change. The rising VD rates were not all rapid, were not all related to houses of ill repute. Men and women wanted companionship in a rapidly changing world. Many VD exposures could be traced not to a house of sin, but a brief interlude between a soldier and a willing girl. But some communities were more open than others to visually showing change. While the newspapers of Illinois bluntly stated that men should, quote, put a helmet on your privates before they see some action, Quote. The Ogden Standard Examiner was announcing public health meetings more centered on those attending and the food served. Funding was pulled from one local clinic, fearing its use on VD treatments. Meanwhile, testing was done at a booth at the Illinois State Fair. The U.S. Army attempted more moral arguments. Soldiers were inundated with messaging that VD was akin to helping the enemy. Guilt was also employed, but there was recognition that even given, quote, free smokes and card games, men would seek out more illicit fun and adopted the stance, if you can't say no, take a pro. Prophylaxis stations were set up across the country near bus and rail stations. Condoms were available at every gate leaving a military base. VD films were nothing new to the military. Fit to Fight was shown to every soldier during World War I, but new ones were produced to warn of the good time Charlottes who might seem free, but eventually exact a price. The Bloomington the Bloomington Pantograph and Champagne Gazette routinely published maps of these pro stations. The newspapers around Hill were not so eager. One thing is similar though, soldiers who contracted VD were reprimanded and lost pay. This is not to lead, mislead that the officials at Hill were not culpable. After threatening the surrounding towns in 1943, the federal government announced in 1944 they would provide free treatment for social diseases. Hillfield announced in August 1945 that they would create health classes, including ones on the effects of venereal disease. August of 1945 seems a bit late. The key part, the, uh, the key point to this is success at combating venereal disease rate requires both sides to take responsibility. Soldiers training for war need a bit of fun. Wholesome fun leads to no disease, but 100% compliance is not realistic. Communities arguing over immoral taxi dances versus local dances where a guy might meet a willing girl miss the point. On the flip side is the army without a consistent base program. One provides condoms and cleaning stations, while the other one chides local communities for not having a pre preventative plan. The military always struggles with civil relations at bases, new and old. There are expectations on both sides. A boost to the economy can be welcome, but an influx of young men with money in their pockets can also be a threat. 
As one of the most important aspects of studying history is figuring out why this matters, it's important to look at these two bases for their similar yet different aspects and their experience with disease rates being an important issue. For the work to matter, it must be referenced later. An argument could be made for these two bases that the military didn't look to the past to see what, would, what worked. At the dawn of World War II, the government looked to avoiding the issues of the First World War. The government, let's see, but once it was over, they neglected to apply the knowledge as future wars created further expansion. During the next two decades, many installations expanded as the Korean War and Vietnam escalated. Yet they still experienced the conflict with communities over the continuous problem of venereal disease. Fayetteville, North Carolina saw the problem explode in 1952 as Fort Bragg trained foot soldiers and Pope Air Force Base was created. The term VD itself became so odious that by the 70s, 1970s, the term STDs replaced it, strangely because people felt sex, the term sexual was preferred to the term venereal. However, there's been little change to the way the problem is approached. Again, Mars creates a battlefield and Venus quickly sees an opportunity. Thank you very much, Heidi. That was also a very interesting presentation. I missed half my slides. <laughs> oh, well, let's see. <laughs> there would be a pro kit. This is a list of prophylactic stations. This is an interesting fact, uh, interesting pamphlet. This was published in 1940 by the US Army. They did not change a word of it the entire war. Hmm. And while they wanted to express to men uh, about morals and guilt. They also wanted to let them know that sex is one of the most important things and it makes you a man. So they had very conflicting messages, but by the end of it, they just gave up and said, just clean yourself up. And this was the most amazing ad I found. I can't even, Imagine it made it into a newspaper in the 1940s. That's quite a collection of slides. Um, excellent, excellent work in digging them up. As I've listened to these two presentations, something that H.L. Mencken wrote over a century ago in a book of prefaces uh, reverberates strongly in my mind. Mencken wrote that a city that has been cleaned up is usually in worse condition than it was before. Quote, the Puritans who finance such enterprises get their thrills not through any possible obliteration of vice, but through the galloping pursuit of the vicious. We might ask, should public health departments work to minimize venereal disease in the general population? Yes. Should the military take steps to reduce venereal disease in its ranks, especially in wartime? Yes. I confess that I personally would not want prostitution going on in my own neighborhood, and I wouldn't want anyone I'm related to to be ensnared by it. Nevertheless, the bulk of what we've just learned about Ogden and venereal disease in the mid 20th century comes from the American Social Hygiene Association. Sarah Langston has gone through the Social Hygiene Association's archives relating to Ogden with a fine tooth comb. And we are in her debt for educating us on the association's worldview and modus operandi. During the World War II era, the Social Hygiene Association was surely praised for its zealous oversight of city's public health campaigns. But in 2021, I am uncomfortable with their pronouncements and methodology, which I find to be puritanical and clueless. 
Several times in the association's memos that Sarah cites, we heard the phrases Negro prostitution or black prostitution. The implication is that African-American involvement in prostitution is a greater cause for alarm than lighter skinned races participation and that law enforcement would be justified in cracking down harder on African-Americans than on others. Nowhere in the social hygiene squad's recitals of venereal disease statistics do we detect any suggestions for expanding economic opportunities for underprivileged citizens, which would have been the most effective deterrence to prostitution. In the Social Hygiene Association's records with its conversations with Ogden leaders, Sarah uncovered their low opinion of Mayor Harmon Peary for being uncouth and for not cooperating in military drives to rid Ogden of its loose women. I'm struck that the association blamed Mayor Peary for Ogden's high rate of VD from 1944 to 1947 years when he was not in office. The association failed to observe that Peary was loath to shut down less glamorous venues of prostitution as long as Ogden's high class hotels continued to host prostitution with impunity. Or that even Peary's political enemies admitted that he never profit, per, profited personally <clears throat> from the fines paid by brothels and gambling joints into the city treasury. The Social Hygiene Association seemed not to understand the, the mechanics of running a city. Sarah also found that the association conflated the jurisdictions of the mayor of Ogden and the Weber County Sheriff, when the sheriff is answerable not to the mayor, but the county commission. The association appeared to care more for filling jails and meddling in Ogden politics than in formulating plans to redeem the underprivileged. Or as Mencken had, uh, wrote, they are more interested in the galloping pursuit of the vicious than any possible obliteration of vice. Heidi Chudy had the inspiration to compare the World War II venereal disease situation in the Hillfield Ogden area with Rantoul, Illinois and the nearby Chanute Army Airfield. The greater overall success of the Illinois effort to minimize venereal disease seems to stem from a more realistic local attitude towards normal human behavior in wartime. Heidi reports the difference in news coverage in Illinois, where the former was open to promoting use of condoms in sexual encounters, <clears throat> but Ogden saw news coverage, um, <clears throat> limited to who attended the meetings and what food was served. The Illinois press publicized the locations of prophylaxis stations, while the Utah press did not. Heidi also explained to us why the military's lack of a uniformly administered community outreach program hindered Ogden's efforts. I hope these two excellent papers will prompt further research into the still sensitive topic of Ogden's wartime struggles with venereal diseases. Clearly, a local tendency to blame the African-American community for behavior that was normal throughout the entire human race was not a functional solution. Statistical comparisons with other air, air base areas in the US would help to shift the research from the subjective to the objective. I thank these two scholars, Sarah Langston and Heidi Chudy for their deep research and engaging presentations. And now I think Jed is jumping back in. I have one question. <clears throat> I would like to ask Heidi Chudy, what inspired you to select the uh, Chanute Air Force area in Rantoul to compare with Ogden and Hill, Air, Hill Field. 
Well, <laughs> that would be that um, I've spent my entire life in the military. I was an army brat, Air Force wife. And when I was going to grad school, Chanute was about an hour away. And I wanted to do something on World War II and the interaction between the communities. So I started with their research available and I've always wanted to compare it to another base and see what, see what occurred. I found that very innovative and I, I'm very glad that you did that. <clears throat> Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, all three of you, for your excellent uh, presentations. I have a couple of questions, um, but I also want to make sure, Heidi and Sarah, that you can also ask questions or offer any comments. Um, I, Sarah, I was struck by the political jostling that occurred at the local, state, federal levels. Um, and in the middle of all of this were, were women. Um, mostly women working in the in prostitution, some uh, people of color, as you and uh, Val had mentioned, and all demonized seems uh, as being more culpable than men for, for venereal diseases. And so um, what do we know, if anything, about uh, these women in the, in the histories you, you tell, Sarah? I mean, and you too, Heidi, if you want to comment on this, strikes me, you know, the archive as well as, as, as well as anyone. Are there voices missing in the archive? And if so, what does that, what does that say about the historical record? Um, I, for prostitutes, the voices are definitely missing um, because they, it was such a transient um, line of work. Um, Utah was part of the inner mountain ring where they would rotate between um, different cities. And of course, as Val knows, you know, a lot of them didn't have use their real name when they were arrested. A lot of them had pseudonyms. And so trying to track down those stories are very difficult. Um, it really is looking, you know, finding a lot through the papers. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to actually interview Alta Ross Kelly um, for a, the oral history project I did a few years ago. And trying to get her to, you know, give a little more information and flush a little bit more out. Um, so it, it is very much, I think women's history in general is lacking. Um, but then when you look at sort of these um, marginalized groups, it's even more, um, you know, as Val said, with the African American, the, the emphasis, the ASHA had on Negro prostitution and the, it was really interesting. I didn't go into a whole lot of detail about it. Um, but, you know, again, that side is completely just, you know, for right now, you know, lost. And so, you know, trying to research, trying to find ways of gathering, you know, as much primary source information as we can. Heidi, for, for you, I found those, the, the messaging to be um, fascinating, the messaging that occurred during the war, those posters that you showed. Oh. I'm wondering, two, two questions about that. Did those, did those posters and images appear in Illinois and Utah alike? And then um, were the public health campaigns, you know, the posters, the messaging, the advertisements, were they, they were directed primarily seemingly to male soldiers um, during World War II. Was that a shift from the kind of messaging that the army had been putting out in years past, say during World War I or, or thereafter? There are more posters. I, I suppose I could have put up there directed more at women. Um, but I would say it did shift more into World War II that uh, towards the men of, okay, you're in charge here. <laughs> um, this is what's happening to you. You need to, you know, it, it goes back to, if you can't say no, take a pro. And that was, was, that was directed at men in every situation, not just seeking prostitutes, but you meet a girl at a dance. You don't know who she is. She could be working for the enemy. You, and so they, it was definitely a shift towards just the soldiers were to be on the lookout. The army, while they wanted the rates to fall, they were very uh, harsh with the, with the soldiers who did get venereal disease. 
up until 44 when the magic bullet arrived, they you would lose six weeks of pay if you, for being treated with venereal disease. And it was really a, um, a mark on your record. You'd have a specific reprimand for it. And while they yelled at the outside communities to clean up their act, they still put the soldiers mainly at fault for what occurred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in in these posters, uh, where did you find those images, the posters that you showed? They're everywhere, actually. Um, You can find them in the Library of Congress. I have a book of them. (laughs) Um, There's there's just a plethora of them on the internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, I was trying to get the, I couldn't get the the sound to work, but there's a recording of Joan Merrill singing, You Can't Say No to a Soldier. And while she might have thought at the time it was a very... Uh, innocent song. It was not. If you listen to the exact words, it's, you know, he deserves a romance. He's going to go out and die. Don't say no. (laughs) So trying to think of some other, there's the movie, the movie fit to fight from 1918 was reworked in world war two. It's, I could not find a clip of it to put this, but there's the, basically the script is these three guys go out on the town. One has a good time. One says no, one stays back in the barracks and it follows them and what they, what occurs to them. And of course, the one who goes out on the town has a good time, gets venereal disease, loses his six weeks of pay and never progresses much in the military because of the mark on his record. Did the two of you coordinate or know that the other was doing research on this subject? Um, no idea. And then no. who, you know, who <laughs> else has, who else, who, who has done work in this field and what more needs to be done, do you feel? I, so for me, when I was researching, I became really fascinated with the rapid treatment centers that were established. Um, and I would like, I mean, if I had more time, I would have tried to find more information on the one in Salt Lake. Um, there's a bit about, you know, nationally what they were like and, you know, um, especially about with Leesburg and things. But to know that Salt Lake had established one Um, that there was such a push to send or force people to go there. Um, But the fact that most of the patients were women, that the men were not, I mean, there were very few when I looked, most of them were women. Because again, it's that whole thing of women were seen as the carrier to the disease and men were the victims that it was all the women's fault that the men contracted these diseases. And so they thought if we can just cure the women, then the men will be fine. I'd say one of the things I found throughout this is um, one of the fascinating areas looking at other, I would say countries or even um, territories. Hawaii had an amazing rate or amazing um, control of the venereal disease rate but not maybe not the way we would want to because they were under martial law. They were able to enforce um, weekly checks of the brothels. Women had to be cleared every week to go back to work. So it's it, one way to control it, but it very demeaning for the women involved. Well, Val, uh, do you have any other questions or Heidi or Sarah, any questions for each other or for Val? Uh, I don't have any more. I would I would hope that these two women continue their research, though, because they're both on to something interesting and important. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. Thank you so much, all three of you, for um, for your comments, presentations and um, Thank you for all, all of you tuning in to this, uh, to this session. So thank you very much. Okay.